Mm. We did good. We did good. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. So over the years here in the US, it's become pretty much a trope that Jews eat Chinese food on Christmas. And uh, that's because it's true. American Jews have been housing chow mein on Christmas since roughly the 1930s, when both the Chinese and Jews were relatively new to the country. The neighborhood Chinese restaurant acted as a safe haven, so to speak, for Jews and Chinese during a time of year when it was pretty easy to feel out of place. So it's quite common for Jewish people on Christmas to either order in Chinese food or go out to eat Chinese food. So I got to thinking, if the holiday feast is supposed to be special and festive, why outsource it? Why not do it at home? Put down the phone, fold up the takeout menu, slide it back in the junk drawer because we are going to make our very own Chinese American smorgasbord from scratch. But before we do, let's talk about some ingredients that we're gonna be using. I hesitate to call these specialty ingredients because remember, this is Chinese American food. Meaning a lot of this stuff, nowadays you can get at a well-stocked grocery store. Most of these items are used in more than one of the following recipes, so they're gonna do double duty. I'll list all of these out in the description below, along with a link to buy them yourselves if they're available. Let's begin with our centerpiece, our piece de resistance, our general sow duck, not chicken. If peckin' duck and general sow chicken were to have a baby, it would be this. We'll borrow some technique from making peckin' duck, but use the flavor profile of general sow chicken. First, remove the little bag of innards from the cavity if there is one, then remove the neck if it's still on, then chop off the wing tips, which would just burn up in the oven, then trim any excess skin off, and it's optional, but I like to trust the bird with kitchen twine to keep it nice and taut. Now we're gonna parboil the duck in seasoned liquid consisting of enough water to cover the duck, a quarter cup of light soy sauce, one bunch of scallions, two heads of garlic just cut in half, five whole star anise, and a two inch knob of ginger. Bring the poaching liquid up to a simmer, then carefully lower the duck in and cook for three to four minutes. Parboiling the duck helps to tighten the skin up and also breaks down collagen, allowing the skin to crisp up easier in the oven. This technique is straight out of the Peckin' Duck playbook. As the duck cools, we're gonna make a simple glaze for it. To a small saucepan over medium-high heat, add three tablespoons of brown sugars, three tablespoons of dark soy sauce, a quarter cup of rice wine vinegar, a tablespoon of hoisin, a teaspoon of chili oil and toasted sesame oil each, a half cup of chicken stock, a pinch of MSG, aka the god particle, and finally another pinch of kosher salt. Bring the whole shadiddly up to a boil and reduce it by a third or so, or really just until thick and viscous, then remove it from the heat and set it aside. Now that the duck is cool enough to handle, we're gonna season it with a mixture of two tablespoons of kosher salt, a teaspoon of brown sugar, and another teaspoon of black pepper. Mix that all around, then season the duck liberally on all sides, including the duck hole. Now using a sausage poker or just a pointy sharp knife, poke holes all over the duck. Plop the duck on a sheet tray fitted with a wire rack, then let it sit uncovered in the fridge overnight for up to a week. This is what the duck looks like after five days. So you can let it age for whatever your schedule allows for, right? The closer to the seven day mark you go, the crispier the skin is gonna be. Directly from the fridge, place the duck in the middle rack of a preheated 425 degree Fahrenheit oven and cook for 20 minutes. This is going to allow the fat in the skin to get a jump start in its rendering, which just means crispier skin. If you couldn't tell by now, duck is all about crispy skin, and that's what we're doing here. We're really trying to just get that solid crunch. 20 minutes in, open the oven and carefully brush the duck with glaze all over. I mean, really all over. Get into all its little crevices. Now close the oven up and reduce the heat to 300 degrees Fahrenheit and let it cook for another 20 minutes. Glaze, then repeat the process once more for a total of three glazing sessions. Whew. After an hour of cooking time has passed, check the internal temperature of the duck's leg every 15 minutes. Once the temp reads 160 Fahrenheit, remove the duck from the oven and let it rest at least 25 minutes before slicing. All right, so maybe another 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Could you sub chicken for the duck if you can't find one? Absolutely, you totally can and it will be tasty. However, I feel like duck is just a little more special and you know, after all, tis the season. Do you wanna be good or do you wanna be great? Come on. Eh. Every good feast needs a green thing. In our case, it's this Chinese broccoli. Bring a large pot of salted agua to a boil, then drop in the Chinese broccoli, blanching it for two to four minutes or until the stems are cooked through. If some of the stems of your broccoli are super thick, aka more than one inch, just go ahead and slice it in half. Once they're cooked, shock the greens in an ice bath, then remove them from said ice bath and pat dry with paper towels. 
To finish, arrange the greens on a pretty serving platter and drizzle on half a cup of oyster sauce, a tablespoon of toasted sesame seed oil, and make it rain sesame seeds. Set that aside for now because it's time for every little kid's favorite thing on the menu, fried rice. Which starts with the rice. Peep this. So this is just day old rice that I cooked, spread on this tray and put in the fridge. And as you can see, it's very dry and crisp, which means it's going to absorb flavor very well. AKA it's the perfect rice for fried rice. You could totally use fresh white rice, that's no problem, especially in a pinch, but if you got the time, I really recommend doing this. Transfer six cups of that rice to a large bowl and set it aside. Slice up a half pound of peeled and deveined shrimp into half inch little pieces. Next, preheat a wok or a heavy cast iron skillet over high heat for five minutes. Then, add in a tablespoon of neutral oil and stir fry the half pound of shrimp with a pinch of salt for about a minute. Then, add in the six eggs, cooking just until the eggs begin to scramble. Then, transfer the whole mixture to a plate and set it aside. Now add the remaining quarter cup of neutral oil to that wok, let it get hot for about a minute, then pop in the four cloves of minced garlic and the one inch knob of minced ginger. Cook for 15 seconds just until aromatic, then toss in the two cups of diced yellow onion, one cup of bean sprouts, and half a cup of green peas. I just use frozen peas. Season with a pinch of salt, then cook for four to five minutes until the veggies begin to soften. This wok sucks. Now pour in six cups of that reserved white rice, one teaspoon of brown sugs, half a teaspoon of white pepper, and two tablespoons of dark soy sauce. The challenge of using a wok at home, unless you have like a super powerful outdoor burner, is not having a powerful enough stove to truly stir fry, a sensation known as wok hay. A little trick that my friend taught me to get that wok hay flavor, right, that sort of sensation of the fire coming around the pan and sort of licking the food, giving you that charred taste, is to use one of these torches. You can just kind of move it around and literally you don't even have to flip it, just stir things around and just kind of start burning the rice. Again, the torch is totally optional and sort of extra, but it is a fun little trick. Now we can cut the heat. Slide the reserved shrimp and egg back into the mix and stir everything together until it's evenly dispersed. Now just transfer all that rice to an appropriately sized serving dish and garnish with thinly sliced scallywags. Okay, now every smorgasbord needs a fried thing, and today it's all about the egg roll, specifically the chicken egg roll. Start off by slicing half a head of cabbage, three stalks of celery, and two carrots into thin strips. Now get the wok super hot over high heat, add in a dash of neutral oil, then add the veggies with a pinch of salt and cook down until it seems like most of the water has been cooked out. About five minutes. We really don't want soggy egg rolls here, so take your time with this step. Reserve the cooked veg in a large container, then add in one pound of our ground chicken thigh. Stir the chicken around, cooking until it just starts to brown, then deglaze with an approximate two tablespoons of Shaoxing cooking wine. Reduce that down until it's nearly dry, then add one teaspoon light soy sauce and oyster sauce each, followed by a half teaspoon of ground white pepper, Chinese five spice, and sugar each. Transfer the ground chicken mixture to the veggies and allow it to cool while you preheat a large pot of oil to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. This feast includes like four, yeah, four separate dishes. Uh, I feel like making your own egg roll wrapper is going a bit extra, but if you're an overachiever, you can go ahead and make your own. I'm personally not going to. These are the ones that I'm using. Grab yourself a single wrapper, then place about a third cup of the cooled filling right in the center. Use a brush and some egg wash to paint the edges of the wrapper, then fold the whole shadidly up, sort of like a mini burrito. The egg rolls should be stuffed and honestly sort of large. These are not lumpia. Shoot for one and a half by four to five inches or so. Nice, nice little logs. Now fry the egg rolls in batches, first at 300 degrees Fahrenheit for 3 to 4 minutes, then remove them and let them rest on a wire rack for at least 5 minutes as you work through the other ones. Then increase the heat of the oil to 375 degrees Fahrenheit and fry the egg rolls a second time until golden brown and crispy, about 3 to 5 minutes more. Check this out, this is why we double fry. The first fry pre-cooks the product and starts removing moisture from the outside, then they rest, that moisture accumulates, and the second fry cooks that moisture off and develops sort of this awesome golden brown crust that you wouldn't get otherwise. Of course, egg rolls are not complete without dipping sauces. 
To make a classic spicy Chinese mustard, to a bowl, add a quarter cup of cold water, followed by a half cup of yellow mustard powder and a dash of soy sauce. The water has to be cold or else the mustard's not going to get spicy. Whisk that mixture all together until smooth, then let it mellow out for 30 minutes before serving, or the mustard's going to be way too pungent. To make a classic sweet and sour sauce, to a small saucepan over medium heat, add a teaspoon of neutral oil, a quarter cup of ketchup, three tablespoons rice wine vinegar, two tablespoons water, a quarter cup of brown sugars, a tablespoon of light soy sauce, and a teaspoon of cornstarch mixed in with a touch of water. Mix that all together until smooth, then simmer until thick, then remove it from the heat to let it cool. There's no dancing around it, that was a lot of work, but you know, good cooking takes time, and I can assure you it's well worth it. Tis the season of giving, and this, at least in my book, is a hell of a way to give. Your guests are going to have very high levels of stoke when they see your beautiful spread on the holiday table. Oh, and I should probably note, I understand that a lot of this stuff is not kosher. Like, literally, it doesn't abide by the laws of keeping kosher, or whatever, but, you know, I'm not that kind of Jew. There she blows, Chinese American feast from scratch. We have our vegetable, our protein, our big centerpiece, our carb, and then our fried thing. No matter what you celebrate, I wish you happy holidays from all of us here at Omnivorous Adam. I hope your winter is full of friends and feasting, and I bid you farewell until the next episode. <laughs>